Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to welcome everyone here this morning to the seventh meeting of the Pennsylvania Public Utility Commission and ask that you all rise and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The first matter on this morning's agenda is the approval of the minutes from the March 11th public meeting and it's a pleasure to recognize Commissioner Brown as editor of the minutes. Commissioner Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have reviewed the minutes from March 11th, the 2015 public meeting, and move that they be approved as submitted. Second. Any discussion? Any objections? Hearing none, the minutes are approved as submitted. It's a pleasure to welcome to the podium here this morning to commence with our public meeting agenda items, Ms. Cheryl Walker-Davis. Good morning, Cheryl. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. May it please this honorable commission on behalf of your various offices and bureaus, we present for your consideration and disposition the following agenda items commencing this morning with matters on behalf of the Office of Competitive Market Site market oversight, it should be noted that the first item pertaining to the petition for clarification of Interstate Gas Supply Inc. has been postponed until public meeting of April the 23rd. Uh, it is recommended that the Commission adopt the recommendation of the Office of Competitive Market Oversight with regard to the proposed tentative order involving procedures facilitating natural gas supplier access to natural gas distri distribution company customer account numbers in instances when those account numbers are not otherwise available. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Any objections? Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. Turning now to matters presented on behalf of the Office of Special Assistance, commencing on page two of the public meeting agenda, it is recommended that the Commission adopt the Bureau's recommendation with regard to PPL Electric Utilities Corporation petition for approval of its distri distribution system improvement charge, noting the statement of Commissioner Colley as well as the statement of Commissioner Brown. So moved. Second. I'd like to recognize Commissioner Colley for purposes of his statement here this morning. Commissioner Colley. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I have a short dissenting statement. I uh, won't read all of it. Uh, ask that it be placed in the record. Uh, we have before, it the, before us the exceptions of PPL Electric Utilities and the Office of Consumer Advocate uh, to the recommended decision of Administrative Ju uh, Law Judge Candace Melillo uh, issued on August 1st relative uh, to PPL's petition for approval of a distribution system improvement charge. The final order in this proceeding reverses the decision of Judge Melillo with respect to the inclusion of the Act 129 compliance rider, the so-called ACR um, rates, and the competitive enhancement rider, the CER rates, in establishing the maximum allowable disk charges. While I appreciate the small increase in complexity this may introduce into the maximum disk charges allowable under an approved disk, I believe that the plain language of Act 11 limits these rates to an approved percentage of distribution rates. As articulated by Judge Melillo, there is an insufficient nexus between the CER and ACR charges relative to distribution charges as required under the statute. Accordingly, I agree with Judge Melillo that PPL's disk should be recalculated without the inclusion of ACR and CER revenues, and PPL should have issued appropriate refunds. Lastly, if there is a need to increase the disk uh, or the disk charges above the 5% uh, of distribution rates, statute provides that a utility may petition this commission for a higher percentage. And I think that's what should have been done rather than including the CER and ACR charges. So with that, I respectfully dissent. Thank you, Commissioner Colley. Now I'd like to recognize Commissioner Brown for purposes of her statement here this morning. Commissioner Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will be submitting my comments for the record, but I will, will take the opportunity to summarize some of them. 
One of the topics deliberated in this proceeding involves the inclusion of certain charges in the calculation of the tariff disk ratio, namely whether or not the Act 129 compliance rider, uh, known as the ACR, and the competitive enhancement rider, known as the CER, should be included in the denominator of the disk ratio. Both the ACR and CER are non-bypassable riders. As legislative counsel involved in the legislative process leading up to the passage of Act 11 of 2012, I can say that during that process, the key focus was prescribing the eligible property component of the disk or the numerator. There was much less of a stringent focus on what constitutes the components of distribution rates for purposes of DISC, the denominator. I believe the General Assembly gave deference to the Commission's expertise on this issue. I, I just didn't realize I'd be sitting here at this time when we looked at the first one for electric companies. Um, but looking at the code, the statute does not delineate between distribution rates that are set under Section 1307 i.e. the riders, and rates that are set under Section 1308, uh, the rate base and expenses. In fact, conventional analysis of an electric utility bill and the breadth of law surrounding it will compel most to determine that distribution rates are simply those that do not include generation and transmission. The statute only restricts one specific distribution component from inclusion in the disk for energy utilities, and that's the state tax adjustment surcharge. Nowhere does the statute restrict the inclusion of riders in the denominator of the disk ratio. In fact, the Commission's Act 11 final implementation order directed companies to include all applicable clauses and riders in the formula for disk rates. Excluding the CER revenues may motivate utilities to place these expenses into their next rate case, and there's nothing in the statute expressly prohibiting the inclusion of competitive market enhancements in 1308 designed rates. Further, these costs support competitive market enhancements in the benefit of distribution cu customers. As opposed to the CER, the ACR costs are mandated to be recovered via a Section 1307 mechanism. However, I re reiterate that there is nothing prohibiting the inclusion of these costs in the DISC calculation. I also emphasize that the energy efficiency and co conservation costs recovered via the ACR in large part benefit distribution customers by reducing consumption and electric bills, including the distribution portion of those bills. Moreover, retaining these costs in the disk calculation does not eliminate the consumer protection cap placed in the statute. It will merely extend the disk investment period between rate cases or increase the disk expenditure pace. Both scenarios can provide benefits to ratepayers through decreased rate case expenses or the accelerated increase in service quality, which was the legislative intent behind Act 11. Last, I note that the decision does not restrict the Commission from continuing to analyze distinct distribution charges and the prudency of including them in the disk calculation. Items such as on-bill financing may certainly be ripe for further discussion in the future. Therefore, given my review of the body of law and the discussion of the parties in this case, I support the inclusion of the ACR and CER in the calculation of PPL's disk. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? We'll note the objection here this morning of Commissioner Cawley. Hearing none, the motion passes here four to one, noting the dissenting statement of Commissioner Cawley as well as Commissioner Brown's statement here this morning. It is recommended that the Commission adopt the OSA recommendation pertaining to the petition for reconsideration and the application proceeding involving Interstate Nursing Services, Inc. at the bottom of page two as well, as all items appearing on pages three, four, five, and six through and including the recommendation involving the joint petition of Consolidated Communications of Pennsylvania Company LLC and CenturyLink Communications LLC for approval of an amendment to their interconnection agreement. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Any objections? Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. On behalf of the Bureau of Technical Utility Services, again in omnibus fashion, we recommend the adoption of all items on page seven, commencing with the uh, recommendation in the proceeding involving Tri-State Household Goods Tariff Conference, Inc., continuing with those items on page 7, 
And on page eight, the first item pertaining to the application of Unified Energy Services, LLC. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Any objections? Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. With regard to the application of Momentum Telecom Inc. for approval of the discontinuance and abandonment of competitive local exchange carrier and inter, inter exchange carrier reseller services to the public within Pennsylvania, there was a joint motion of Commissioners Colley and Whitmer. Oh, I'm for the sorry. record, the case has been postponed until. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I should be corrected to note that that case has been postponed. In omnibus fashion, it is recommended that the Commission adopt the recommendation in the application proceeding pertaining to Story Energy Partners LLC and continuing with the remaining item on page eight pertaining to the application of Worthington Energy Consultants LLC, as well as all items appearing on pages nine and 10 through and including the recommendation in the investigation of existing structures uh, pertaining to the, uh, the highway above the grade of the tracks of the Canadian Pacific Railroad in Great Bend Township. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Any objections? Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. On behalf of the Law Bureau, commencing on page 11, it is recommended that the Commission adopt the first recommendation with regard to the implementation of Act 129, Phase 2, and the Registry of Conservation Service Providers. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Any objections? Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. With regard to the next two matters on page 11, those being the petitions of Commonwealth Telephone Company uh, doing business as Frontier Communications, Commonwealth Telephone Company, as well as Frontier Communications of Breezewood, Canton, Lakewood, Oswego, and Pennsylvania LLC, and their uh, efforts to seek the use of the service price index component of the price cap formula in their Chapter 30 plan to offset changes in the tax rates as tracked by the state tax adjustment surcharge. Uh, we recommend the adoption of both of those items, noting the statements of Commissioner Brown with regard to each. So moved. Second. I'd like to recognize Commissioner Brown for purposes of her statement here this morning. Commissioner Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will be submitting for the record my uh, recusal from both of these matters. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Brown. Any further discussion? Any objections? Hearing none, the motion passes four to zero, noting the recusal statement of Commissioner Brown. And on page 12 of the public meeting agenda, it is recommended on behalf of the Law Bureau that the Commission adopt the recommendation of the proceeding involving Pico Energy Company's petition for temporary waiver of section 56.97 of the uh, Commission's regulations. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Any objections? Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. Turning now to matters presented on behalf of the Office of Administrative Law Judge. It is recommended that the Commission adopt the recommendations in the next four proceedings pertaining to the joint petition for settlement and the recommend recommended decisions of ALJs Buckley and Dunderdale uh, uh, recommending the approval of the joint petitions for settlement in the general rate increase proceedings involving West Penn Power Company, the Pennsylvania Electric Company, the Pennsylvania Power Company, and the Metropolitan Edison Company, noting the statement of Commissioner Cawley with regard to each of those matters pertaining to the settlement agreement singularly, and then Commissioner Cawley's second statement, uh, statement pertaining to the settlement agreement as well as the first energy uh, Pennsylvania implementation plan, audit implementation plan. So moved. Second. I'd like to recognize Commissioner Cawley here this morning for purposes of his combined statements, and we'll start with the first one, Commissioner Cawley. Uh, again, thank you, Chairman, and I ask again these to be placed in the record uh, as if I had read them in their uh, entirety. Uh, these do apply to all four of these great cases that uh, are the subject of a joint settlement. Uh, the first statement uh, involves the uh, companies and the statutory advocates, meaning OCA, uh, Office of Consumer Advocate, and the Office of Small Business Advocate, uh, recognition of the need to address and correct certain service reliability and customer service issues. Uh, and I, I think that's encouraging that they, and especially the companies, have acknowledged the need to address these issues. Uh, at our February 26th, 2015 public meeting, the 
Commission addressed many of these same issues and approved my motion uh, to order certain actions regarding the company's response to the focused management and operations audits that have been conducted by this commission. This order was published on March 30th of this year. I would remind the companies that the March 30th order uh, remains in effect and the need for the companies to meet the reporting and documentation requirements identified in that order by the dates established. To the extent that the companies have made settlement commitments uh, to the statutory advocates regarding performance issues, uh, nonetheless, the commitments in the March 30th order should be viewed as separate from and addition to uh, anything that they've agreed to in the settlement agreements. That's my first statement. Second one is a little longer. Uh, I uh, support the joint settlements, uh, but I have a few other concerns, and uh, I'll mention two of them. The first is the approval of the proposal by the companies to offer LED, that's light emitting diode, LED street lighting to interested customers who wish to obtain LED street lighting service from company owned and maintained LED street, uh, LED street lighting facilities. I fully support the efforts to uh, improve the operational and energy efficiency of street lighting. That's not the issue. Uh, it gives me pause that Citizens for Pennsylvania's Future, that's Penn Future, in the proceeding presented testimony that First Energy's cost estimates for providing company-owned LED street lighting were overstated. There are municipalities that either presently own or wish to construct and maintain their own LED lighting facilities rather than having one of the first energy companies construct and maintain the lighting. But these companies that already own such facilities or wish to construct them wish merely to have distribution service from one of the first energy companies, not have the first energy companies uh, construct and maintain the lights. I think this was an interesting and useful point made by First Energy. Even though its testimony was not adopted in the decision, it raises an important point. How can these utilities help municipalities that have or wish to construct lower cost lighting facility structures to develop deficient LED street lighting? when they want to do it on their own and they just want distribution service. If Penn Future is correct that the first energy companies have overstated the cost of LED street lighting, if the company does it, uh, it is important for the company to develop customer-owned LED street lighting rate schedules to avoid any barriers to full development of this efficient lighting technology. MedEd has, in fact, already implemented such a rate schedule under the alternative technology lighting provisions of its tariff. Similarly, Penelec has implemented the same rate schedule, but only for its Altoona service area. And I know that Commissioner Whitmer is happy about that, but it really ought to be extended to the rest of MedEd's service territory. And unfortunately, Penn Power and West Penn Power have no such rate schedule at all. So the company can do it if it wants to. And I strongly urge all four of the first energy companies to file similar tariffs for the remainder of uh, the Penelex service territory and uh, in the Penn Power and West Penn Power service territories. That's my first point. The second one uh, involves a part of the settlement where First Energy provided for the amortization of its stranded legacy meter costs 
related to smart meter uh, deployment over the next five years. And it included these stranded legacy, meaning existing meters that will be replaced by smart meters uh, in its cost of service. Pursuant to the customer's testimony, or the company's testimony, this allowance is estimated at $23.3 million per year. That cost should be fully recovered by the company in five years. And it is not going to be recurring after that period of time. Uh, so unlike, for instance, an extraordinary storm cost, which would be included as a normalization uh, expense. This is an amortization, but it's really unclear from the settlement language uh, whether this is going to be treated uh, like an amortization, and therefore the cost recovery of $23.3 million a year will continue after five years. I believe that as a true amortization, rather than a normalized annual cost, it should end after five years, but the settlement really isn't clear about that. So uh, the parties may have had an alternative view of this in the settlement. Uh, they may have envisioned that as a part of the cost of service allowance, this $23.3 million annual collection of an expense may continue after the five years and until the company or, uh, files for uh, another base rate case, which of course could occur after uh, five years. Therefore, given the opacity of what was intended, and in light of the fact that non-recurring stranded plant costs uh, should not be recovered at the end of an amortization period, and the fact that it is a large expense, I believe that the companies should clarify their understanding of the settlement agreement when they file uh, their, their compliance filings. So with that, uh, uh, I otherwise agree uh, and will vote to approve the settlements. Thank you, Commissioner Cawley. Any further discussion? Any objections? Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously to approve these uh, four um, cases here this morning. On uh, that does conclude the presentation of regular agenda items. Turning now to the carrying agenda, it is recommended that the Commission adopt on behalf of the Office of Recommend uh, Special Assistance the recommendation involving the complaint proceeding of Shonda Rushing versus Pennsylvania American Water Company. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Any objections? Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. And I believe, Cheryl, that concludes our agenda here this morning. However, I'd like to recognize the Vice Chairman um, this month is a celebration of Safe Digging Month, and I'd be remiss in not recognizing him for his leadership in positioning this commission on a very important topic and initiative, the undertaking the uh, One Call initiative for the commission. Uh, he's worked on this issue. I was joking with him this morning. It's, uh, I might send him over to the Middle East to do peace agreements here soon, uh, but he's done a remarkable job in positioning this organization to take on new duties, and it's uh, most appropriate here this morning that we recognize him for a, um, a recognition of safe digging law. So I'd like to recognize Vice Chairman Coleman. Well, thank you, Chairman, but if my success is any indication of, uh, of how successful I could be in the Middle East, I probably should stay at home here. It's been two and a half years since we've been pursuing this matter, and I can share a little bit more about that with you in just a moment. But, uh, and I'm, I'm sure I don't need to remind any of you that are here in the audience today, I'm sure you all have your calendars marked as uh, Safe Digging Month. Um, I'm sure I'm correct in that, right? So if you haven't, make sure you do so. But uh, uh, on the, the serious note, this is, a, this is really an important piece of business, and it's important that we recognize this on an annual basis, that each year in Pennsylvania, there are over 6,000 hits to facilities in Pennsylvania. And that in some cases, those may be minor incidents. In some cases, they may result in, fas in fatalities. So <clears throat> it's important that we, uh, we recognize uh, Safe Digging Month on an annual basis and make sure that, uh, that those who are in the field digging do take a very simple uh, time to call 811 to make sure that they are marking those utilities in the field before they dig. 
Uh, this morning is we're marking the 43rd year of the PA one call system, and I just wanted to share a little bit of uh, of data uh, behind the notification system with you, just to give you a sense on the size and the magnitude of the effort of PA one call. Each year they uh, respond to over 750,000 calls that they receive. So these are contractors, excavators, these are homeowners that are calling the one call system, the 811 system, and asking that those utilities be marked in the field. Uh, as a result of that, the one call organization then notifies all of those facility owners that have utilities in that area. And each year that is there over 6 million notifications to facility owners in Pennsylvania. So it's a significant amount of work uh, that is going on on an annual basis to make sure that we all remain safe as excavators uh, and contractors are digging in and around uh, utilities in Pennsylvania. Uh, I also wanted to uh, take a moment to, uh, to uh, commend Chairman Godshall in passing House Resolution 188 that is also recognizing PA 811 Safe Digging Month, so uh, uh, thanks to the General Assembly for being on board with this important endeavor as well. Uh, the last piece, and the chairman uh, is noting that, is that the unfortunate part of this are the hits. And again, each year in Pennsylvania, there are at least 6,000 documented hits to those facil facilities that are in the ground that are being hit uh, primarily by third-party contractors. That's an important piece of business for the commission in realizing that the threats to the underground utilities in Pennsylvania uh, are uh, at greatest threat by those third party contractors, not as much by aging infrastructure was certainly a big issue here at the commission. But the, the greatest thing that we can do as a commission is to try to reduce those number of hits uh, and to reduce the damage to utilities in Pennsylvania. So uh, we are, uh, again, pursuing that as a legislative priority. Uh, we are thankful to Representative Matt Baker, who's been a champion in this regard, who has, again, reintroduced House Bill 445, and we are looking forward to that moving in the House, getting over to the Senate, and moving that enforcement responsibility from the Department of Labor and Industry into the Commission, and that we will move forward with a aggressive campaign in enforcing the PA one call law. And the real goal here is to change behavior and reduce hits. So again, I thank you uh, this morning for uh, acknowledging. Make sure you go back and mark your calendar for 811. Uh, it's nice to see many of you who have the 811 license plates and logos on your vehicles. I know many of you see this as an important initiative, and I, uh, I thank you for that. So again, thank you this morning for uh, the time to acknowledge Safe Digging Month. Thank you, uh, Vice Chairman Coleman, and again, thank you for your leadership on this issue. And I seriously, we'd, we'd love to send you to Geneva to do the peace accord with the, uh, with the Iranian government, if you could do that on the side. Uh, realizing I, I don't think we have any other items to come before uh, the commission here this morning, we are adjourned.